Thank you for being here with us, whether it's in person or over Zoom. As we sing, I invite you today, why don't you stand, whether you're at home or here in the sanctuary, as we celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. O come, O ye faithful. It's hymn number 145 in the Pew Hymnals. Let's sing together. Welcome here this morning. During Christmas, the long awaited season, we celebrate God coming to dwell with us in our humanity. We celebrate the ordinary and everyday, which will never be either again, because God has entered the world and transformed the boundaries between sacred and earthly. If God can be found in a barn, is there anywhere that God might not be? Let's pray. Lord God, we gather together this morning with a variety of emotions, from Christmas excitement to weariness and sorrow, to boredom and more. Oh Lord, meet us where we are at today. Just as you were found in a barn, turn our eyes and our hearts to find you today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Welcome in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Jesus Christ is born for us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Christ, Christ is, is born. born. Well, 
shepherds kept their watching O'er silent flocks by night All throughout the heavens There's on a holy light Hallelujah, go tell it on the mountain Over the hills and everywhere Go tell it on the mountain Jesus Christ is born The shepherds feared and trembled When low above the earth Rang out the angel chorus That hailed our Savior's birth Hallelujah, go tell it on the mountain Over the hills and everywhere Go tell it on the mountain Jesus Christ is born Down in a lowly manger The humble Christ was born And God sent us salvation Okay, kids. Well, I'm going to give you a little bit of a sneak peek right now on the reading that Hillary is going to do for us later, because I just love it. I think Christmas, we did so much, so many things with our, our little ornaments that we made, getting ready for Jesus, and it's just so exciting. And then Christmas Day, oh, Christmas Day is the best, isn't it? But then if you're a little bit like parents, we think, whew, well, that's over, and it's all done. But that's not the end of the story, of course. It's not actually all done. And then Hillary's going to tell us all about how the wise men show up. And they're talking to Herod. And you see, Herod's a little upset because he's like, I'm the king. What do you mean? There's a king hanging out somewhere in Jerusalem, king of the Jews. And he's not too happy over this, of course. So King Herod decides, I'm going to find him and get rid of him. So he wants to stop this plan, this king of the Jews. So he's a little bit of hot air, I would say. And we're going to, clearly I have the thing for balloons, doing balloons again. We're going to put some of King Herod's hot air in here. I think he's got a little more hot air than this, though. 
I'm a little worried to put more hot hair in. And he goes, I'm going to stop this plan completely. But oh my, he's just a person. And we know, of course, God is God. And when he has a plan that he's put in motion, there's no changing it. So here we have God's plan. And my hot air is going to go in here, but we're going to pretend it's really God's. Ooh. And God, of course, isn't just full of hot air. He's full of lots of good things. And, of course, God's plan always goes well. And as we're going to see, Hillary's going to tell us a little bit more. So you guys, make sure you listen really hard when Hillary starts reading the scriptures for us. Once again, why don't you stand, whether here or whether at home, as we continue to celebrate the birth of Jesus. On Christmas night, all Christians sing to hear the news the angel bring. On Christmas night, all Christians sing to hear the news the angel bring. News of great joy, news of great mirth, news of our merciful King's birth. Then why should we on earth be sad? Since our Redeemer made us glad, then why should we on earth be sad? Since our Redeemer made us glad, when from our sin He set us free, all for to gain our liberty. All out of darkness we have light which made the angels sing this night. All out of darkness we have light, which made the angels sing this night. Glory to God and peace on earth, now and forevermore. Amen.
Good morning. After a completed grade eight panel. Today's response of reading is taken from Psalm 98. Would you please all read responsively with me? The Lord has made salvation known and revealed righteousness to the nations. The Lord has remembered love and faithfulness to Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with instruments and with singing. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together with joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for the Lord comes to judge the earth in righteousness and the peoples with equity. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever and ever. Amen. Our gospel reading this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 13 to 23. This picks up the story of the wise men. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there till I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I have called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, was in a furious rage, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time which he had ascertained from the wise men, spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation. Rachel, weeping for her children, she refused to be consoled because they were no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus reigned over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and dwelt in the city called Nazareth, that what was fulfilled, spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled. He shall be called a Nazarene. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everyone. Please join me in prayer. Lord, we pray your spirit would unite us today, whether we're in the building or on Zoom or somewhere else, and that you would empower both the speaking and the hearing so that the message, the word, the inspiration that you want us to hear and experience uh, will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. For many of us here today in the building or on Zoom, We have experienced a Christmas like no other. Some of you, sadly, have had to keep a Christmas alone for the first time. For ourselves, our own family, we're grateful that our 
we got our parkas on and we were able to gather Christmas Eve in our backyard around a fire to sing carols and sip hot apple cider. Several in the family remarked that this may be the best Christmas yet. By God's grace, the weather made outdoor gatherings an option for some. Christmas morning, we FaceTimed our grandchildren and using our nativity set, we dramatized the events um, from Luke 2 for them. It's a beautiful and inspiring story. But there is a dark side to Christmas, to the Christmas story as well, that doesn't set so well. The coming of the Messiah didn't immediately bring peace and goodwill to all men. According to Matthew, within two years of Jesus' birth, murderous King Herod of Judea sent out a death squad to slay the Bethlehem boys under two. No surprise for someone who history records killing many members of his family who, because he feared they were a threat to his throne. From the 5th century on in the Western Church, the Feast of the Holy Innocents has been observed uh, to, for us tomorrow on December 28th to remind us of this event. As you heard in the scripture reading, this is the event the angel warned Joseph and Mary to escape from. It reminds us that the death of innocent or inconvenient children continue today at the hands of people who have power over them who do not see their inherent worth. For Mary and Joseph, the peace of the nativity is shattered yet again when Joseph is woken from his sleep by a dream in which the angel of the Lord commands them to escape to Egypt that very night. When you read the word Egypt in Matthew's nativity story, or as you heard it this morning, what images immediately come to mind? Uh, maybe pyramids, camels, they're part of most of our memories in some way or another. I'm grateful to Pastor Joel for inviting me to share with you that what may be a lesser-known dimension of Jesus' early life, his time in Egypt. And also, I thank Pastor Richard for operating the slideshow right now, so I don't have that distraction. Egypt is featured in the biblical stories and promises of the redemption of humanity in both Testaments. As it was called upon to save Jacob's family from famine, it is called upon again to provide a safe haven for God's son. In 2009, while doing research at American University in Cairo for his U of R honors degree in history, our son Brian invited me to join him to visit parts of Egypt and Israel. This picture was taken when we visited a Sunday service at St. Mark's Coptic Cathedral in Alexandria. Uh, it was in Coptic, so we didn't understand a word of it, but the spirit and the unity and the joy that uh, we so often feel when we travel to other congregations was clearly tangible for me. I was interested in the history of Christianity in Egypt and especially traditions of the Holy Family's time there. Now, a few disclaimers. I'm, not a, I'm only a student of this topic, not an expert. You will hear me use the word tradition often. I will also likely mispronounce the names of the places we, all, we will touch on because I don't know those languages. Traditions usually fall short of scientific accuracy, but they usually start somewhere based on something. We like to say where there's smoke, there's fire. Think of your own family traditions. You may not know when or how they started, but they contain an element of truth that you organize your life around. That is the basis for this message I share with you today. I will not answer all your questions, but it will sample traditions that 10 million of our Coptic brothers and sisters in the body of Christ take very seriously. I'm inspired personally by this material because I think it is, at the very least, plausible, and more. The chronology of the visit of the wise men and the flight to Egypt is a complex one with no certain answers. How old was Jesus when he visited Egypt? Estimates vary from a few weeks to two years. The visit may have been somewhere between 6 and 4 BC. 
And at this point, our scientific minds tend to get hung up on being precise in these matters. But to those at the time, and much of the time since, the events and their significance are the most important focus, not the precise chronology. There are two sources for this message. One is an official Coptic Orthodox source on the left, the escape to Egypt. And the other is a publication of the American University in Cairo, Christianity in the Land of the Pharaohs. Within two to three hundred years, Christianity had almost entirely succeeded three thousand years of Egypt's established religion and was dominant until the Muslim conquest of Egypt in the mid-seventh century. Annually, on June 1st, 10 million Coptic Christians around the world, the majority of whom are in Egypt, celebrate the arrival of the Holy Family. One of their liturgical recitations states, Be glad and rejoice, O Egypt, and her sons and all her borders, for there has come to thee the lover of man who is before all ages. The next picture I took uh, is of a large mosaic depicting the journey to Egypt at the entrance of the Hanging Church. Uh, its foundation hangs on the walls of the ancient Roman fortress of Babylon in Old Cairo. On the website of the St. Mary and Joseph Coptic Church in Richmond Hill, Ontario, the escape of Jesus, Mary and Joseph to Egypt is summarized. At this time, this was a very difficult journey filled with many dangers. There were three routes followed by travelers into Sinai from Palestine to Egypt. Their escape, um, see the Holy Family had to avoid the well-known routes and traveled guided by God and his angel. They carefully traveled day after day through hidden valleys and across uncharted plateaus in the rugged wastelands of Sinai. They endured the scorching heat of the sun by day and the bitter cold of desert nights. They were preserved from the threat of wild beasts and savage tribesmen, their daily sustenance miraculously provided. And so they arrived safely for God, for God had preordained that Egypt would be the refuge for the one who was to bring the message of peace and love to mankind. While in Egypt, all the places where the Holy Family passed were blessed. There are many stories of miracles that occurred during the Holy Family's journey. So my guess is that this 400-kilometer journey to Egypt from Bethlehem could have easily taken at minimum two weeks to four weeks or more. The next slide is a very important one. It gives you an overview of the 22 locations along the traditional route that Mary, Joseph, and Jesus traveled in Egypt. And it takes a little while to absorb, but to me it looks like a reverse question mark um, loosely. And so they started on the east side of the Nile Delta, and they made their way north and west over to Wadi El Natrum on the west side of the Nile Delta, and then made a beeline down to the area of Cairo, where they spent some time, and then traveled by boat down the Nile, uh, eventually ending up in Azut, about 400 kilometers south of uh, Cairo. So again, this is not familiar to probably most of us, but there's a substantial amount of, of early confirmation of, of the, the broad strokes of what I'm sharing with you today, going back to people that lived uh, two or three centuries uh, after the events. In the next slide, we get, uh, we get to a, a map that's more familiar, or technology, and that is uh, uh, using Google Maps from a satellite. And you could see the greenery of the Nile Delta and, and get a sense of why it was called the breadbasket of the ancient world, that the Nile just provided life to that whole area, and it was an abundant place According to Dr. Edward Lambolette and writer Jill Camel, the most well-established and widely related Coptic traditions have the Holy Family traveling from Bethlehem across northern Sinai, arriving near Zagazig in the Nile Delta at sunrise. And so Zagazig, you can see there, is one name for it is Bubastis. Um, Zagazig there on sort of the southeast 
uh, area of the Nile Delta. And you can see Bethlehem to the far right upper corner of the screen, uh, just outside of Jerusalem and the Sinai Peninsula below, Peninsula below. Jill Camel writes, Joseph walked to the village of Zagazig in search of food and drink, but he was harshly turned away and returned empty-handed. At sunset, a farmer called Elkum returned home from his work in the fields and spotted the family under a tree and asked who they were. Mary told him that they were a poor Jewish family who had come from Palestine looking for the fortress of Babylon, which is called Old Cairo today, and they would soon be on their way. Aquon invited them to his house to replenish their supplies before continuing their journey. Alcum's wife told Mary of the city and the temple of Bastet. Mary expressed a wish to see the temple, and as soon as they set foot inside, the pagan statues crumbled in a cloud and fell to dust, which Coptic Christians believe was foretold in Isaiah 19 and verse 1. An oracle concerning Egypt. See, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and comes to Egypt. The idols of Egypt will tremble at his presence and the heart of the Egyptians will melt within them. News of this incident naturally spread rapidly, and the governor of the region ordered an immediate search for the woman and the child. Rumors filled the streets about his determination to deliver the child to Herod. Elquam and his wife, realizing it was not longer safe, no longer safe for them to linger, guided them towards Bilbus, where both Coptic and Muslim sources alike relate that the Holy Family was warmly received. Yes, Muslims have traditions of the Holy Family being in Egypt as well. Instead of traveling directly to the nearby fortress of Babylon, which is now in Old Cairo, they appeared to have taken a three to four hundred kilometer detour, first moving north across the west, then first moving north, then west across the Nile Delta, stopping at five other traditional locations along the way, including Alhamra Lake, and then the Wadi Natrum nearby before arriving eventually at the fortress of Babylon. One reason for the detour may be that Herod, res responding to possible rumors of their escape, may have sent spies to Egypt and sent word to allies in the Roman army to watch for the family. Although extremely thirsty, as, as they made their way to the west edge of the Nile Delta, they could not quench their thirst at salty Lake Hamra. As they stood there, fresh water miraculously flowed to the surface. Today, this sweet water spring has been tapped and a wall built around it, and a path of large stones from the shore of the lake gives access to the pilgrims and the tourists. It's not too hard to imagine that Joseph and Mary would have appreciated these and other miracles as divine encouragements on their perilous journey. From Elhamra Lake, Jesus and his family finally arrive at nearby Wadi Natron. Today there are four monasteries there, including one dedicated to Macarius the Great, who was one of the founders of the early monastic movement uh, in the fourth century. As an aside, for the theology students among us, in the Methodist churches, Macarius is regarded highly for his writings on the topic of entire sanctification. From Wadi Natron, the Holy Family now headed southeast toward the fortress of Babylon, as we described earlier, now called Old Cairo. Along the way, it's hard to imagine that they would not have seen the pyramids. And so when our son and I visited the pyramids, it was cool to imagine Mary and Joseph maybe with Jesus on Joseph's shoulders, pointing out the pyramids, which by that time may have been more than 2,500 years old. Imagine little Jesus gazing upward, following Joseph's finger as he pointed to the top of the 480-foot-tall Great Pyramid of Giza, which we are standing next to there. And this is not an advertisement for Coke. Uh, there was no water up there to drink, and so... People scratch to make a living in Egypt, and there are many vendors hauling ice-filled chests um, up to the site of the pyramids and offering coke uh, 
at what we might consider a reasonable charge. On the east side of the Nile River, within sight of the pyramids, stood the Roman fortress of Babylon. This era is, area is now called Old Cairo, as I've said too many times, and three churches are built on the site based on strong traditions that the Holy Family stayed there for a few days. Now, there's a sign that greets the visitors to Old Cairo when you go there, and it refers to two of the three churches within. Uh, the three churches are St. Sergius, St. Barbara, and the Hanging Church. And so you can see the sign there, the crypt of the Holy Family over St. Sergius Church, where the Holy Family lived for some time, and the Church of St. Barbara. In the next slides, you will see the Church of St. Sergius and the room under it, built uh, on the traditional site of where the Holy Family stayed with Joseph. Based on one tradition, uh, he may have actually picked up some casual work uh, with his carpentry trade uh, at the fortress at that time. And so we actually enter at below ground level. Uh, this original entrance to the, the church was built, the first church in the 4th century, as many of these churches were uh, in Egypt and on the sites where the Holy Family uh, apparently stayed. It's been rebuilt and restored many times since. Uh, the, most, the, the last major rebuild was in the 12th century, and of course there's been updates to that build. So the next slide shows an interior view uh, that's been maintained in one form or another since the 12th century. So you're beginning to see now um, that, as it hadn't occurred to me before visiting there, that Christianity has a deep root uh, in Egypt uh, with great significance. Now tourists can peer down into the room that's underneath. Uh, you can't go down there. Um, and this is where Cop Cop Coptic tradition says the Holy Family lodged. They see it as a typical fulfillment of Isaiah 19.19. 19. On that day there will be an altar to the Lord in the center of the land of Egypt and a pillar to the Lord at his border. Jill Camel writes that from there, Old Cairo, they went south to, the, to Medai by the Nile and stayed with some well-connected Jewish families. Jo Joseph became acquainted with some of the local fishermen there and hired a boat to transport them, transport them to southern Egypt. The, tr the tradition is that they paid for the boat with, you guessed it, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. On the way, a strong tradition indicates they visited a, t a town called Benesa on the west uh, side of the Nile and stayed outside the city for four days in a village. Jesus was thirsty and began to cry, and as they approached a nearby well, they found that it was deep and the water was low. Mary touched Jesus' finger to the well, and fresh water immediately rose to the surface. Even Muslim sheiks in the area today quote a passage from the Quran. And we have made the son of Mary and his mother a portent, and we gave them refuge on a height, a place of flocks and water springs. From Behesa, the family stopped at several other places, including uh, Gibel Alter, at least 200 kilometers south of Old Cairo. By now, according to the traditional route that they had traveled by foot, animal and boat, they had gone nearly 1,000 kilometers from Bethlehem. As they sailed into Gebel Altair, according tradition, to tradition, Mary feared for the safety of Jesus because of a large rock that threatened to fall on their boat from the mountain above. But Jesus extended his hand and prevented it, its falling. There apparently was a rock for a long time with a handprint in it that was kept in the area. At Gibel el the, the building you see on the, on the cliff there, is the Church of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and it was commissioned by uh, Helena, or Helena, the mother of Constantine the Great around 328 AD. Uh, Constantine was one of the late emperors of the, of the Roman Empire and uh, converted to Christianity um, in about 312 and um, made it the national official first made it 
free to practice it. Until then, uh, it was illegal to practice it to varying degrees. But he made it legal and um, from then on began helping with building churches and the era of Christendom uh, began with the support of the Roman and later European governments. It is on the eastern bank of the Nile overlooking the valley. The church is built on the site of a cave where tradition says Jesus and his family took refuge. Many ancient churches in Egypt may have been commissioned by Helen, Helena, sorry, sorry, Helena. Constantine's conversion, as I said, occurred in about 312. And so therefore, as mother of the emperor by 328, Helena would have had access to resources and influence to make these projects happen. After stopping several more places, the family finally settled for an extended period of time in Deir el Makarak, or what is now called Azut. So you can see it's down uh, further down the Nile. Actually, you could go that much further from Cairo yet before you got, get to Aswan. Uh, it's incredible how the length of Egypt from north to south. Azud is about 400 kilometers south of Cairo, and according to tradition, the family stayed there six months. My guess is that they had now traveled at least 1,200 kilometers from Bethlehem by foot, by animal, and by boat, and must have felt relatively secure uh, down there. One tradition suggests that they had use of a house uh, during, that, during their stay, uh, another says that they lived in a comfortable nearby cave. There is a festival in August that can attract over three million pilgrims to this area to remember the Holy Family's time there. After six months, sorry, after six months, the time where the angel appeared to Joseph and urged him to take the young child and his mother and to return to Palestine, that time had come. This time they were able to make the most direct route back because those that had sought their life uh, had died. Hosea 11 and verse 1 um, gives an advance um, directive about Egypt being the place where Jesus is called from. When Jesus was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son, which Matthew quotes in his um, presentation of the nativity. Coptic tradition believes that Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, and this is their tradition, stayed in Egypt up to three and a half years. Muslims say seven. Some of us might ask, why Egypt? Why would that be a part of the story? Uh, one of the great church fathers, the Bishop of Constantinople, John Chrysostom, um, just about 300 years later, um, in the fourth century, uh, made the following comment in a commentary on this event. But wherefore, it may be said, is the young child sent into Egypt? In the first place, the evangelist himself, Matthew, has mentioned the cause, saying that it might be fulfilled that out of Egypt have I called my son. And in the same time, beginnings of fair hopes were thenceforth proclaimed before the world. That is, since Babylon and Egypt, at that time most in the whole earth, were burnt up with the flame of ungodliness. He sent the one, uh, that is the wise men, to Babylon, and to the other, Egypt, he himself visited with his mother. So Chrysostom imagined the wise men conveying the presence of the Messiah to their homeland and Jesus himself to Egypt. In this event, many see parallels with Israel's history um, uh, with, sorry, in this event, many parallel, there are many see parallels with Israel's history and Egypt's. The word Bible commentary states Matthew's gospel has in mind the story of Moses as he narrates the story of Jesus. Here are some of the parallels that they suggest. Pharaoh and Herod, both rulers, sought to kill male babies. Uh, Jesus is a type of the Moses saved as a baby from death in Egypt. Moses and Jesus flee and return to their homelands, from their homelands and then return to their homelands. Moses and Jesus summoned, are summoned back to their homeland after Pharaoh or Herod die. 
And interestingly, in both Exodus 4.19 and Matthew 2.20, the nearly exact same phrase occurs. For all those who sought your life have died. As Western Christians, we tend to focus on the land of Israel and its importance to our faith history and future, and well, we should. But Jesus' trip through Egypt, including his long detour uh, across the Nile, uh, the Nile Delta, may not have been to avoid Herod's spies. It may have been to demonstrate God's plan to include the Egyptian people in his desire to save all nations and honor Egypt with his own presence in both Egypt and Israel. Coptic Christians through nearly two millennia have taken great comfort from Isaiah who foretells a day when nations like Egypt, Israel, and Assyria are brothers. That would have been unimaginable uh, in, in, that hi in history at that time and certainly uh, continues to be today. Isaiah writes, On that day there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrian will come into Egypt, and the Egyptian into Assyria, and the Egyptians will worship On that day Israel will be the third with Egypt and Assyria, as blessing in the midst of the earth, whom the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my heritage. It's hard to imagine sort of the equivalent geographic territories today uh, getting along in this way. Israel, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Egypt, all worshiping the same God together. That may seem impossible, but through the eyes of faith, Nothing is impossible with God. The presence of these children, who I photographed hanging outside after church, people there hang around just like they do here in pre-COVID pre times, and hopefully we will again in post-COVID times. They're hanging out just being children after church at St. Mark's in Alexandria, and it struck me that they are uh, the descendants of this eloquent testimony preserved by Coptic Christians. It's a testimony to the continuing outcome of the presence of the Messiah and Mark and 2,000 years of Christians in Egypt. Amen. Thank you so much, Eric. Let's stand once again as we continue to celebrate Jesus' birth and the salvation that he brings to all nations. Good Christian friends, rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Give ye heed to what we say. Jesus Christ is born today. Ox and ass before him bow, and he is in the manger now. Christ is born today. Christ is born today. Good Christian friends, rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Heal ye here of endless bliss. Jesus Christ was born for this. He has opened heaven's door, and we are blessed forevermore. Christ was born for this. Christ was born for this. Good Christian friends, rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Now ye need not fear the grave. Jesus Christ was born to save. Calls you one and calls you all to gain his everlasting hall. Christ was born to save. Christ was born to save. Christ was born to save. 
good Christian friends rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Give ye heed to what we say. Jesus Christ was born today. Ox and ass before him bow, and he is in the manger now. Christ is born today. Christ is born today. You may be seated. Let me pray for us this day. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for the encouragement of the journey which we have recorded on the pages of our Bible, the journey uh, which you and the flesh have made, uh, the journey depicted uh, for us here this morning. Lord, we celebrate during this Christmas time the wonder of God become flesh. Lord, we ask that we would continue to be challenged and encouraged, comforted and called with this good news, with this witness and testimony. We thank you for those who carry it forward today and we pray that our own deeds, actions, words, and thoughts might continue to carry this message forward into our streets, their neighbors, in our city, in our context. Lord, today we do come in and recognize that while we desire to serve you, we fall short. And Lord, we lift up our prayer of confession to you during this time of prayer. Lord, we ask that you would renew us. We ask that you would cleanse us. We ask that you would renew your call upon our lives. As we present ourselves to you, Lord, forgive us, restore us. Give us a sense of your mission for us during this time. Lord, we ask your blessing on those in our fellowship who have found this Christmas season perhaps specifically difficult and challenging. Lord, we pray for those who have suffered the loss of a loved one in recent weeks or months. Pray for those who are in or have been in transition. Lord, due to phase of life, due to health, due to employment or finances, Lord, we ask that your blessing would rest. Lord, we pray for those who carry burden, burdens of loved ones, who are facing challenges or difficulties. Lord, we pray that you'd bring wisdom and insight, patience and peace into these contexts and situations. Lord, for those with ongoing ill health and struggles, we pray that you would bring healing. But Lord, in the meantime, we pray again that your hope, the hope that you provide and give would be felt and known. Lord, we pray that you would surround and abound to those in need. We do pray and ask for healing. Lord, we pray and ask for provision as needed. Lord, we pray and ask for comfort and peace. Lord, we lift up the unspoken concerns that people carry as well, the things that they have been, for whatever reason, unable to share. Lord, I pray that you would hear their cry, attend to them. We pray for your church, your church here at First Baptist, your church in this city, your church in this province and in this nation. Give us wisdom in these times and during the ongoing COVID season and situation. Lord, I pray that your spirit would abound to us and through us. Lord, renew our vision and our purpose at this time. Remind us of the journey that we are on as we carry the name of Christ. And we join our hearts in prayer as you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. of Christ. Amen. Thank you to our Oregon student, Xavier. Let's stand and sing together. I invite you to stand at home as well as we celebrate again. Joy to the world. i 
I'll share with you a benediction from Ireland today. May there always be work for your hands to do. May your purse always hold a coin or two. May the sun always shine. May the sun always shine on your window pane. May a rainbow be certain to follow each rain. May the hand of a friend always be near you. May God fill your heart with gladness to cheer you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Well, hello, everybody. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Long time no see. I miss you all as I know you miss me. Love you. Pray for you every day. We'll be back again soon. Never forget the reason for the season. Jesus is Lord and God bless you all. Thank you. We do really miss all of you during these unsettled times. We wish you and yours the gift of faith, the blessings of hope and peace and his love at Christmas and always. This Christmas is more like an old fashioned Christmas. When I was a boy, we were more isolated on the farm. We had way less presents. And yet we were very close in our family ties. We do have the greatest gift in Christ. From our home to yours. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Merry Christmas, everyone. From Jack and Tracy Sailor. Peace to all. Merry Christmas. You know, uh, we are supposed to wish people Merry Christmas this year. But with all of the things going on with the pandemic and COVID, it is hard to wish people a Merry Christmas when there's not very much merriness. But I would like to say, I miss the church very much. Jesus is still in command. God is on the throne. But I wish everyone a meaningful Christmas this year, if not a merry one. So, a meaningful Christmas to all of you. God bless you. Happy So my name is Adija, yeah, Adija Pasi. I would like to wish everyone you have a Merry Christmas and uh, God bless you. I wish you everyone Merry Christmas, God bless you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Uh, Merry Christmas everybody. Have a wonderful, restful and fun vacation. Merry Christmas, everyone, from Esther Guernsey. This will be a different Christmas, as we know, but we know that God has not changed, and I wish for you his blessing and his peace throughout this time and throughout the, the coming new year. He will never leave us nor us. So Merry Christmas and take care. Merry Christmas from Rob and Tiffany, and a Happy New Year. I hope you're all well. Merry Christmas, yes. everyone. Sorry, Merry Christmas from our home to your home. Uh, our prayer for you this Christmas is that you will be filled with hope, not because of anything the world promises, but because of everything God has promised us in Jesus. And may the knowledge that God has come to us in person in Jesus and that Christ will come again, bring you much joy at Christmas and all through the new year. There's lots to be thankful for and looking forward to in this new year. Uh, love, can't wait to uh, see all of you again in person, but uh, uh, look forward to reconnecting with all of you. And I just want to say how eagerly I love each Sunday morning to scroll along the bottom of the screen and just see each one of you. And even though we can't be in person, that means so much. And we just really pray that your Christmas, even though it'll be very different this year, that you can find richness and beauty in, um, in our Savior and what Christmas is, is really all about. And we just wish each of you and your families the very happiest of Christmases. And, uh, and our wish for the new year is may your 
days be positive and your COVID tests be negative. All the best. Happy New Year and Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Joyeux Noël. Merry Christmas, everyone. Enjoy the season. Hello, uh, I'm Alan Baskin. This is my wife, Eva. We would just like to wish everyone a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Mm. Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas from, from the O's. <laughs> Hello. The people who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. For unto us a child is born, and his name is Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace, Mighty God. I would like to wish you all a very Merry Christmas in these difficult times and hope that you can find the peace of Christ in your life and that you can celebrate the birth of our Savior. Merry Christmas, everyone. Hello, everyone. We want to just take a few minutes just to wish you Merry Christmas. We hope that you and your family and friends will experience the joy, the hope, the love, and the peace of, of Christmas. And on behalf of our family, on behalf of Debbie, who's sitting right here, my much better half, and she does speak. And I, I think she's even going to say something. Merry Christmas to each one of you. Just know that you are loved and you are missed. Merry Christmas. Well, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Zinosh, as uh, most of you know, and uh, in this time of pandemic, I am grateful that God has kept all of us safe and sound. And uh, now we're in, in the festive season. So from my entire family and me, a Merry Christmas to you all and a Happy New Year. Hopefully this coming 2021 should be good and uh, healthier than the past one. God be with you. Merry Christmas from Gloria, Germany, and our family, Tadio. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Can you say Merry Christmas? Merry Christmas. And a Happy New Year. Wishing everyone a safe and Merry Christmas.